Hello denizens, welcome to Polaris Sector. It's a new 4X out on Steam, came out about a, a week ago, and looks interesting and I wanted to cover it. Uh, you might be having a slight sense of deja vu. I put up an episode on about a week ago on this one, but I ultimately took it down because I hadn't originally intended to do this first episode as just the game setup and basic overview, and so I wound up with this weird disjointed episode, and I wanted to go back and do this a little bit better. So, uh, for those of you who feel like you've seen it before, uh, we're also going to be covering the basic UI later on. So this game is put out by Slytherin, and uh, it was all done by one programmer, which this is pretty impressive for one programmer. Now, there were some other people that helped out with the graphics and the music, but all of the programming is done by one guy. So props to him, because this game is actually pretty detailed for one guy. Now, what this 4X is, is this is kind of positioned as a, a mid-weight 4X. It's definitely lighter than something like Distant Worlds, but it's, it's definitely deeper than something like Endless Space. Which, Endless Space was too light for me. I, I felt like I didn't make enough meaningful, consequential decisions. This game seems to be aimed kind of in the middle of those two, where it's a little bit more empire management, um, but, and you're making strategic decisions, but it's definitely not that heavy simulation that you get in Distant Worlds. It plays out as a real-time, pausable 4X. This might strike you as somewhat similar to Europa Universalis 4, where you can progress time in a scaled fashion and pause at any time, and events can happen that will also pause the game. This is different from the traditional 4X, which of course is turn-based. And this game is kind of positioning itself in an interesting place. It's coming out bef just before Stellaris comes out, which is currently slated to come out on May 9th, as well as the new Master of Orion. And that's an interesting timing. I feel like they're probably pressured a little bit to go ahead and get this game out before those hit, because those are big names. Stellaris has all the backing of Paradox Entertainment behind it, which is behind some of some very popular strategy games, Europa Universalis that we mentioned, as well as Crusader Kings, Hearts of Iron, that sort of thing. And it looks like it's shaping up to be that classic 4X and really, really detailed, and I'm excited about it. As well as the new Orion is coming out, and um, I feel like this game was probably pressured. There's some areas where I feel like it can improve, but it definitely has some interesting concepts, and it's worth seeing if this is your type of 4X, because it might be right up your alley. So here we have the Galaxy Selection screen, and an interesting thing that this game does is it has two kind of classes of galaxy. It has this elliptical galaxy, which is just kind of a generic map that uses star lanes as choke points and advancement points. And this is, this is familiar if you've played 4X before, uh, particularly in space. But you don't have to play with these star lanes if you don't want to. There are other galaxy types over here that, as far as I can tell, don't have the star lanes. I have to admit I haven't actually played enough of this game to know because I've been playing through an elliptical galaxy map that uses star lanes. But when you create your game, you have a choice of whether you want to play with star lanes or without. And this is, this is interesting, and we've seen this in Stellaris. The videos we've seen, you have a choice as to whether you, what type of hyperspace travel you want to use. And this game allows you to pick that in your map selection settings. We'll probably be going with an elliptical galaxy, but some of these map types look pretty interesting. Here, this segmented galaxy, the default number of races is nine. So I'm guessing that there are three in each one of these nodes, and then the center is left free for all. And there's probably some valuable planets in there. So you may want to take over your node and then try to push in the center so you have a place to, to build ships and advance from. You're not being attacked on multiple fronts. Potentially, you have some choke points here if there are star lanes. And the, or you might want to, if you start, say, here, you might want to rush into the center and see if you can just grab up as much territory before someone comes in and tries to contest that territory. We'll be playing on the Elliptical Galaxy, which I feel is kind of the default. It's the first one on the list. It's just 
kind of the default here, but you can change the settings here to increase the size of it, to change the amount of star lanes. So if you want star lanes, but you want a lot of star lanes, you can crank this up. We'll keep it at the default of 1.75, just for give you a sense of the default game. I believe this is randomly generated. I'm not 100% sure. There's also this 3D shape here, which you can kind of rotate the map a little bit. Honestly speaking, for the sake of recording, we might drop this down so it's perfectly flat. This isn't going to affect the gameplay any. We're still going to have the same number of stars, but this is going to prevent the, oh, we've got stars hiding behind other stars and, and dealing with that. This isn't necessarily something that you would want to do when you're playing, but for a recording, I feel like it's better to probably move this on down so we get a perfectly flat map. Aspect ratio, I don't know why we would care. This is just kind of the, the sphericalness of the map. Over here we have the game difficulty, and what I like about this game is normal difficulty is, of course, normal. But in normal difficulty, your empire is the one that's getting the bonus, not the artificial intelligence. In a lot of games, Civilization is particularly bad about this, where the difficulty is determined how much of a cheating bonus the AI gets to keep up with you. In this game, no. In normal difficulty, you're actually the one that needs the two times bonus to be able to keep up with the artificial intelligence. That's promises relatively strong AI. And hard is when you are equal with them. There is no cheating AI in this, as far as I can tell. We're going to turn off victory by domination. This is a victory condition that has parallels in other games, uh, such as Galactic Civilizations and some of the other modern 4Xs, where they're trying to solve a particular problem, where in the late game, the game just drags on as you slowly slog your way through the last remaining sectors, wiping out the opponents. I personally don't like victory by domination. I would rather completely win. Rather than reach some point in the game where I feel like I've finally managed to crush my opponent and then, oh, well, you win. You know, here, an early do domination victory occurs if you control 40% of the stars. Obviously, if the opponents manage to control up to 15%, then, um, then that turns off. But usually this shortens the game, but I feel it does so artificially. If an opponent gets ahead of me, I'd rather fight from behind and try to overcome them. And, you know, if, if I feel like I'm going to lose, then I'll just stop playing and I'll start another game. I don't need the game to decide, you know what, you've lost this game, we're not even going to give you a chance. No, I don't like that. I'd rather be able to fight from behind and, and at least try to overcome them. External threat is kind of a late game monkey wrench that you have to deal with. It mentions there being this strong external enemy that appears at the end of the game, probably to challenge whoever is winning, if they, especially if they have that victory by domination. I have no idea what this is. It could be some giant space worm that comes around and eats planets. No idea. If that is the case, I don't have any spoilers. I just made that up. Next, we have pirate attacks, which will attack your infrastructure, try to block planets, that sort of thing. Uh, you can turn them off if you don't want to deal with them. We're going to leave them on just to see how they work and how that changes the gameplay. It may be that, that you need that... Um, to prevent you from just echoing up entirely. You may need some sort of barbarians, if you will use the civilization term, just to, to, to prevent you from just solely focusing on eco and research. Next up you have the race selection screen. And race selection in this game is, it's nice that the picture is not tied to the race attributes. And what I mean by that is we can go to any race here and reset it to a default. For instance, this race right here. If we just move all the sliders to the middle, we have 10 bonus points to distribute. I could go over to another race and I could do the same thing. So that means you can pick any picture you want and you have all your options open to you. But one thing you do need to consider is that if you encounter this race in the game, or this race, or something, they are going to have the bonuses that you see here. Whether or not you take that bonus is entirely your choice. But, for instance, these, these I call them teddy bears, um, they're going to have great production speed, they're going to have slightly faster research speed, they're going to have good alien assimilation, but they're going to be terrible at espionage. Apparently because they're bad at hiding the fact that they're teddy bears. But that's what they're going to be. When you encounter them in the world, that's what you will be encountering every time you encounter them. 
But we could say, well, we don't like, we don't want teddy bears like this. We'd rather they be all about uh, population growth and let's make them great spies, you know. Um, actually, it uh, looks like I'd have to take some negative to do that. So now they're great spies and there's tons of them, you know. We could do that. Additionally, you can choose from these technologies over here. Uh, let's go to a race that doesn't have any. And uh, let's free up the points so we can look at those. You can choose bonuses, bonus technologies that you wouldn't ordinarily have. I don't know if these are technologies that then you could research later in the game or whether the, because I feel like you could research Interceptor later in the game, but maybe not. You know, it says this is just a larger version of this fighter spaceship, but I don't know if the other races will never be able to get that. Uh, the, the number here is the number of points that it takes to, to get this technology. And if you choose one, you, you can choose another one. So if we take, uh, so if we take, for instance, this cheapo one, I could then take another one. I could take as many as I want. Okay, so let's quickly go over the races and then I'll show you my pick for a race. I am going to be choosing a default race. Uh, one of the ones that's just configured out of the box here for you. Uh, because I don't know enough about the game to know what I need to overcome or what my personal weaknesses are. So first up we have the Space Cats. Uh, here are the Sharatar. These are notorious pirates. Their best benefit is this really low fleet upkeep cost. 30% less uh, maintenance required to keep up your fleets. This is really nice because that's going to be resources that you will be able to invest in production and developing your planets. They also have slight bonuses to trade, as well as morale and espionage. The only downside of this race really is that they have nothing exceptional about them other than their fleet upkeep cost and slightly increased food consumption. Next up, we have the Aryans, which is sounds really wrong. Sounds like Aryan, but I can't think of another way to pronounce that. They have an aquatic race perk, so they're going to have an easier time colonizing aquatic worlds, but they're going to have a harder time colonizing other worlds. This is a perk because you're going to have a selection of planets in the beginning of the game that other people are going to be uninterested in. So you'll be able to go in and colonize planets that other people just won't be able to at the beginning of the game. So you kind of can carve out your chunk of the galaxy a little bit easier. But other than that, they really have nothing really going for them. They're just slightly happier. That's it. Next up, we have the drills, which are all about population growth and being happy about doing it. They're horrifically bad at research and incorporating other races and being spies. There's just a lot of them. They're great slave labor, and they're happy about it. Next up is the Gavikans, which have great morale, which I'm not sure the difference between general happiness and morale in this game. It, it just says that you're resistant to invasion and xenophobia. I don't know exactly what that means, because there is ground combat in this game, but the ground combat is done with military. So I don't know, maybe it just means that your ground forces are really good at repelling the invaders. It doesn't sound like there's kind of like the coring costs like there are in Europa Universalis that I would expect the morale to, to affect. This race really has this heavy ion gun as its main perk, as well as this morale. Other than that, nothing exceptional here other than the trade. They're really good at negotiating trade deals. But what's important about this game is it does not have currency. So we're not talking about trading for money here. We're just talking about trade deals you'll be able to negotiate better ones. If you're not interested in creating trade deals, well, this perk isn't all that useful then. Logans are radio radioactive, or at least they live on radioactive worlds. And you can tell. Just look at that. Magellans are the suspiciously human-like females that apparently can reproduce with human males. A little bit odd there. Less said about that, the better. However, really bad at production, really bad at production growth, but have some nice bonuses. Great research speed, which is the hardest thing to get. Costs nine points to bump that up. They're also really good at incorporating other races or other aliens. 
Again, less said about that, the better. And then they also have this Stargate module, which appears to allow you to create your own star lanes. Again, I'm really interested to know whether this is a technology that becomes available to other races over the course of the game, or whether this race is the only one that's going to be able to get this skill in the entire game. Humans. We really need to, to talk about this. Um, we might need to just start selective breeding. Uh, this is bad. Uh, humans get really, really, really ugly in the future. Um, as in, we're starting to move into XCOM territory here. But uh, humans in this game are portrayed a little bit differently than they are in most 4X games, where actually they're pretty bad at population growth. In most 4X games, uh, humans are the ones that have high population growth, and sometimes they're technologically advanced, but usually they're high population growth, high trade. In this game, complete opposite. They're bad at population growth, they're horrific at trade, they just have a good engine that they start with, good spies, and good mining efficiency. Teddy bears, we kind of already went over, they're all about production and research and biological alloys. The Ergens are all about special technologies, and other than that, Really nothing much to talk about. A little bit worse alien assimilation, a little bit better population growth. Really, it's all about the boson gun, armed special purpose turret. Okay, so I'm going to choose one of the default races rather than customizing one of these races. And for me, I feel like the best fit is actually the Space Cats. I know, I know, I'm sorry. But I do feel like it because of this fleet upkeep cost. For me personally, as a choice for me... That's something that I always kind of struggle with a little bit, is building up my military without dropping the floor out of my economy. And I, I struggle with that in a lot of games where they have this upkeep of your military, and I produce too much, and then it just slows the rest of my economy down, and I can't seem to, to really recover without just getting rid of ships. You kind of slow down all of your economy, and that just slows your ability to overcome your weakness. So I'm actually going to choose... These guys, we're going to be spreading fur balls all over the galaxy. Now this is a plausible real-time 4X game, which means up here you might have seen this in something like uh, Europa Universalis 4, where you can set the time scale that you want to run at, and you can run and pause, and events will come up that will automatically pause the game. And that's all configurable in the options, which events are allowed to pause it, and that sort of thing. But uh, right now we're paused. So I can spend as much time as I like describing the basic user interface and the details of each system that make up this game and make it so interesting. And so unique from the 4X games that we've seen lately. So this is my home world right here. It's the planet of Sharatar, and it's an Earth-like Terran planet. It's got water, it's got land masses, and looks like it's quite well populated. I, I believe these numbers are probably scaled somehow because there's no way that we would be a spacefaring race with only, what, 60,000 people being used. But maybe this is a very active race of space cats, okay? But we can click on that, we can get our planetary summary uh, window, which, eh, looks like it's more complex than it really is. Over here you have your building queue, we can, we can select whether we want to build ships, ground units, or buildings from over here. And down here you can see a summary of what is built on our planet, which is going to affect both the pane over here, which is a summary of what you can and what has already been built on the planet, as well as your production and consumption of resources over here. So, this game features two things about planets that are a little bit different from your standard 4X game that you might be accustomed to, like galactic civilizations or something like that. And that is that you know right from the outset the potential for all the buildings if you were to completely specialize the planet. If I built nothing but farms on this planet, I could get a total of 86 farms. But as I build these, that's using land, it's using resources, it's using coastline that might be used for something else. So as I build farms, uh, all these other categories will drop. So I might not be able to get as much mining done on the planet or something like that. Likewise, if you get a lot of mining or a lot of production, maybe you can't do a lot of farming because air pollution and all that. It makes sense, and it's just a little bit unintuitive because we haven't seen that in a game, not that I know of, we haven't seen that system in a game, at least recently. And this planet, because it's our home world, has already been built for us, and all of those decisions have already been made. 
I didn't make these and then and then start recording. This planet just started this way. And so we have 29 farms here, and you can see, in fact, we built 29, but 57 of them are blocked because there's too many factories, mines, and science centers on this planet. There you go, that's what can block farms. And I believe when you go to build a building, it will show you what the result of that will be using these bar graphs over here. So this planet has 29 farms producing 242,000 food. Resources in this game are global. I don't know about the production resource, which they consider it a resource. I don't know if that is global, but certainly the food, the science, and the minerals are global, which means at one planet you could be producing them and you could be consuming them at another planet without the need for trade ships or this abstract economy going on that you would get in something like Distant Worlds. So you can totally have a giant farming world that produces nothing but food, powering many other production worlds. And that's entirely feasible, and you can just do that in this game without, without repercussion. A planet does not have to be self-sufficient on its own. We also have a colonial module, which basically, I think, exists only to give you that starting production so that the planet can then build other buildings. I think you always get this colonial module, and you'll, by the end of the game, I mean, 2,000 food is, is nothing when we're using 121,000. It's just to get you that start on the planet. Down here we also have our production facilities. You'll notice that we have five mining centers built, and that's these down here. You can see each one of them producing the, the resources that are then reflected over here. We'll go into the resources in a, in a little bit more once we see the economic screen. And then we have our production facilities, which we have four of. We have three factories and one orbital shipyard, and then we have four science centers. And this planet is maxed out. It's kind of a jack-of-all-trades planet with a slight focus on farming. So we also have contextual buttons that will appear down here and that allow us to do things at this planet. So for instance, we can just jump to automatically build a building. And of course, if we had slots available to us, some of these we could build, but these are the only buildings that we know how to build at this time. We could also construct ground units, and I believe these stay the same throughout the game, and these are used for ground invasions, uh, as well as ground invasion defense, and I think police are used to keep your population happy, or at least reduce unrest, which, this is our home world, we have no unrest. It just seems natural. You also have these initiatives that you can enact, and these are decisions that you can enact at the, at the particular planet that you're at that will give you some benefit at the cost of some trade-off. For instance, this one reduces the consumption of food by, or drops it in half, reduces it by two times, but it means that the production of buildings will also decrease by three times. I don't know if this is just the production resource or if it's also the mining. I, I haven't used it yet and it didn't cover it in the tutorial, but we might find that out. In general, these are, these are kind of bad, they allow you to overcome a particular weakness at a planet, but at the cost of reducing the overall effectiveness of the planet. In other words, the, the net downside is always higher than the benefit, unless you're overcoming a particular weakness that you have at the planet. Lastly, you can, you can build a ship. Um, I don't know why it splits it. Build buildings, build ground units, build ships, but it does. And you could obviously get to this from this queue over here. I could say build a new ship and get the same screen. These ships in this game are pre-planned in terms of the shape of the ship, but you determine what goes on the ship. So you can see here, this ship has had these modules placed on the ship. So you'll never get a different layout of this particular ship design in terms of the available space to build, but you can definitely customize what the ship sh uh, modules are in use and uh, what what they're using, how it's laid out, and that can can affect how the ship performs. So you can see here they have a lot of generators, a lot some engines back here, and I actually don't know what that module is. I didn't see it in the tutorial. We'll have to see. And here you can see it has guns on top. Guns in this game can either be on the lower deck, which means they're I have a uh, 90 degree arc of fire, or they can be mounted on top of the craft and have a 360 degree arc of fire. Obviously your top turrets are your higher priority turrets because they can shoot all around the ship, 
but you could also add substantial amounts of firepower by taking advantage of your lower decks if you're willing to sacrifice these areas of your ship to some other to those gun modules instead of using something like scanners for instance okay over here we also have some contextual buttons which are more related to empire management and that, that seems to be a consistent design focus we can click on economics which will show the economics of our empire as a whole and any planets that we know about that we might be able to colonize will be shown over here as well as any that of course we already have colonized so this is our planet it's the same information that was shown in the planet view and up here is your empire econ economics how much uh, of any given resource you have on hand how much you're producing and then the various upkeeps that you have because of either buildings at a planet, because of fleets that you have built, or because of any trade deals you have made where you're giving away resources in exchange for something else. And then you have your result, your net income per period of time. I'm not sure what that period of time is because, again, there's days, months, years, and a time variable time scale. So we'll find out, but I don't know yet because I haven't unpaused the game yet. And lastly, we have these charts over here so we can see all sorts of statistics about how we've been doing either the whole game or from the last hundred years. So you can see all sorts of statistics about you and the other races that you have met, which we haven't met any yet. Once we leave that screen, though, a few more buttons become available down here, such as the ship designer, which allows us to lay out these ships. As I was describing, we could look at existing uh, layouts or we can design our own and we don't have too many uh, ships available to us to design yet but as the game progresses we will get more and more and more in particular i'm going to skip over to this research because that's where we're going to get these ship designs from and the research in this game is complex but brilliant i love the design of this research system i more games should do this so the way this works is as you uncover fundamental sciences, as you increase points in these categories, you will unlock applied sciences. So for instance, currently we have unlocked complex design, nanotechnology, and thermonuclear synthesis. But we haven't unlocked, say, automation. Uh, we'll probably get that as we get more points in... Actually, we should be able to see it over here. Um... Oh, yeah, right there. Uh, we'll get it in two years and 11 months. That requires four points in mathematics. Once you unlock one of these applied sciences, then you put, you put points into these applied sciences, which will, over the course of the game, give you additional technologies, such as the atmospheric dome, the repair module. Nanotechnology will give us interceptors and missile traps. Thermonuclear synthesis will give us this dual TRE. And so these other categories here are some of the applied sciences that we'll get, such as the xenobiology, the automation, the island of stability, etc., etc., etc. And you can see some of these take 110 years for this. That's ridiculous. But what we could do is click on any one of these, set it as a priority, and then the game will automatically shift the points around so that that completes as fast as it can. So we're trying to get... Uh, what is it? Island of Stability. It's still going to take 12 years and 8 months because it requires 130 points in mathematics, but you get the idea. At any point, we can reset back to the, uh, uh, the default, or get rid of our priority here. Now, for the beginning of the game, what we'll probably want to do is go ahead and leave things at the default for now, but probably soon we want to focus on this atmospheric dome so that we can colonize more planets. Just seems like it would be a good idea. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and reset my fundamental science as well. So for the moment, all of our, our research is just box standard default. We're going to un unlock some more applied sciences long before we actually get the benefits from the applied sciences we already know. But what makes this so genius is this is the way that research actually happens in the real world. You have these fundamental sciences that, as you can see, are these broad categories and that we're discovering things in all the time. And then... Along later, we find out what we can use that research for. So, for instance, Benjamin Franklin. He was like, aha, electricity. And it was this advance in, in physics and the understanding of physics and how the world operated. But, you know, we didn't immediately have 
you know, electric power in our houses and light bulbs and computers and all the things that use electricity. That didn't come until way later. You know, we didn't have mass-produced light bulbs until the 1900s, the early 1900s, over 100 years later. And we're still exploring what electricity is today. And, you know, now we know we have this unified theory of electromagnetism, and that's led to all sorts of further uh, explorations. And then we have even, even more things. Once we, now we have quantum. Okay, how does this affect quantum behavior? You know? Your, the, the spinning hard disks that you may still have in your computer, not your solid state drives, but they use the magnetic spin of atoms. I mean, it's just mind blowing. It's stuff that we never knew about way back when Benjamin Franklin was like, aha, electricity. And so we also have these other things, such as, you know, biology. There's the concept of vaccines or antibiotics. But you have to do tons more research to get things you can actually use, technologies that you can actually use out of those applied sciences that you've discovered through fundamental research. This is, this is actually pretty interesting. When you get down and you think about it, just how close this is to how research is actually done. It has me intrigued, I have to admit. We're gonna, like I said, we're going to leave things at the default, but I wanted to go in and talk about that a little bit. Okay, so I think with that said, I think we'll come back and we'll take a look at the the actually getting the, the gameplay started in episode two. I know this is, episode is is just the setup, but uh, that way anybody who doesn't want to watch that setup can just skip straight to episode two and enjoy the gameplay. Thanks for understanding that, and we'll see you next time, folks. <laughs>